For 29 days, the trial of Alec Murdoch took South Carolina and the small town of Walterboro by storm. Do you know where we're going? No, that's what I'm asking you. People from all over have been flocking here to the Colleton County Courthouse. People would line up at 30 in the morning to come into the courtroom. People were watching the trial to see if Alec was capable of murdering his son and also his wife. They are dead on that. Yeah, yes, sir, that's what, it, that's what it looks like. <laughs> For the first time, Alec Murdoch shares his thoughts on the trial. Can't get the images out of my head. No man should have to see what I found, much less have to relive it a second time. And Alec's only living child, Buster, tells his side of the story in an exclusive interview. Did you ever go there and say, maybe it's possible that he did this? No, because I think that I hold a very unique perspective that nobody else in that courtroom ever held. And I know the love that I have witnessed. On June 7th, 2021, Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch were brutally and maliciously murdered by Alec Murdoch. A trial like that is a combination of science and acting and theater. And you've got actors on the stage, and they're all playing their part. But did you make a written note of him saying that? The state, we're in the construction business. Can a six foot four person and a five foot four person still shoot the same angle, just at different distances? Absolutely. The defense, they're in the demolition business. There were multiple tire tracks coming and going. What did you do to preserve those? Nothing. None of this evidence would have met the minimum requirements of the typical CSI forensic show. This is the 300 uh, blackout rifle. It was the totality of the evidence and how it basically worked together like sheet music. Come here, Donald. Come here, Come here, Donald. Come here, Donald. Can you point out Alec Murdoch, the person whose voice you recognize in this video in this courtroom, please? Sitting right there in a gray jacket. There was a gasp in the gallery. Everybody was gathered around trying to argue about what they heard. They may not have had a smoking gun, but they did have a smoking cell phone video. It was as if Hollywood came up at the last minute with the plot twist of whoever would have imagined that that existed. Would you say you think the police didn't do the job? There's an awful lot of pressure on a law enforcement entity to come up with a suspect. You said that you thought they rushed to judgment because the person who found the bodies was the easiest person to charge. Why would they want to do that to your dad? I think it's one of those things where you have to do something. And I think that it was, and that's the, option and the route that they decided to go with. My biggest thing that I want people to realize that there are always two sides of the story. Now they can pick which one they want to believe, but I think there's a heck of a lot that still needs to be answered about what happened on June the 7th. Three days after the murders of Maggie and Paul, two South Carolina law enforcement agents interrogate Alec with his attorney, Jim Griffin, present. One of those agents, Jeff Croft, makes a striking statement about that interrogation while on the stand. Special Agent Croft, when you asked the defendant about the traumatic picture that he saw, Paul and Maggie, what did he say? I did him so bad. I did him so bad? Yes, sir. I was in the car with Alec when he was being interviewed on the 10th. And if he had said, I did him so bad, I would have jumped up and said, what the hell are you talking about? You definitely saw a traumatic picture, and sitting here talking today is, is tough. <laughs> it's just so bad. I did it so bad. There was a gasp in the gallery. Shortly after that, we took a break. Everybody was gathered around trying to argue about what that meant. When we left the courtroom that day, it was a, a classic Perry Mason type moment where the state 
threw that out there for everyone to think about until the next session of court. It's a bell that's already been rung, and you can't unring it, and the jury's already heard it. During his trial for the murder of his wife and son, Alec Murdoch says he kept a journal. He recorded excerpts from it for this documentary. Croft flat ride. Jim is crossing Croft tomorrow. He has the whole night to plan. I want to see him get aggressive with him, although that's not really his style. It's hard to watch someone else cross-examine a witness when you can't do it. I trust him completely. That night before the cross-examination of Agent Croft, we were in our compound. Thankfully, we had that video. You got we had a good IT guy. And, and you definitely saw a traumatic picture. And, uh, and I know it's not hard, or not, not easy. I know it's hard. Uh, Did you slow it down? We hear that. This is so bad. It's so bad. That sounded like that. That click, click. Well, have we gotten our handwritten notes from this? What? Have they produced our handwritten notes from this? No. Darn, don't get them notes. Well, he's back there taking something. He's taking notes. They did it so bad. Well, it sounds like it said. I think it's pretty obvious that he said they did him so bad. But it's very difficult to gauge a jury's reaction to evidence. I've been trying cases for 33 years, and I have yet to perfect the art of interpreting jurors' thoughts. Have our witness back, cross-examination. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Good morning, Agent Bro. Good morning, sir. The exhilaration of a trial is it's three-dimensional chess. Now, from the video, it, it appears you're back there taking some notes. Yes, sir. Did you take notes? I made a mental note of, on it. Did you make a written note of him saying that? I don't recall if I wrote it or not, sir. So it's possible that you're sitting there with a guy who's now been charged with murder on June 10th in the interview. The father says, I did him so bad, and you can't tell the jury you even wrote it down on a piece of paper. I don't recall if I actually made a physical note of it or not, sir. I'm going to play that clip from State's Exhibit 243, which is in evidence. The defense on cross-examination played it at uh, one-third speed, slowed it down. This is so bad. It is so bad. Did you hear they then? No, sir, I did not. I hear I did him so bad. I did him so bad. And I've slowed it down, and I still hear I did it. I did him so bad. Uh, I don't know. I continued to hear they. I heard they, and I got used to that southern accent down there. The first time I heard it, I was pretty sure he said I. But then later I went back and listened to my recording of it, slowed it down, and it sounded like he said they. It was just so bad. They did it so bad. <laughs> it was kind of like those memes, you know, where uh, you, you know you look at it one way, and then all of a sudden your brain flips over and you look at it the other way. And I went back and listened to it and listened to it again, and I couldn't say that that's not what it said. But ultimately, this man was in the car listening to what he had to say, and he said, that's what I heard. I think there's extreme confirmation bias about this. I think if you believe Alec Murdoch did it, you heard I. If you believe that Alec Murdoch didn't do it, then you heard they. It was such a weird moment in the courtroom. It doesn't make a lot of sense, because if the investigator is saying that he said, I did him so bad, then why wouldn't it be case closed? Why wouldn't they have arrested him then? But it isn't just what the jury's hearing, it's also what they're seeing from the night of the murders. I remember we approach the main entrance to Moselle. We can see all the 
police cars and the and the lights shining through the trees. I can't even imagine you get to your home where your family lives and you've spent all this time and it's crawling with law enforcement. Did you go over to the kennels at no, all? No, I did not. People did tell me not to go down there. The crime scene had been like cut off and they sent everybody, sent everybody over to the house. And what'd you say to your dad? I didn't say anything to my father. I walked inside and I saw him and it was utter silence. It was a, it was a big embrace. He immediately broke down crying. I started crying and that was what that was. I mean, it's difficult to relive these, these, um, these tough circumstances. told me that they're showing crime scene photos and body cam videos. I haven't seen any photos or footage with Maggie or Papa. I don't need to. I remember so vividly. I am more certain than ever that Maggie and Paul are going to get lost in all of this. That's it. Witnesses took the stand today to talk about their involvement in the case. I have been a reporter and anchor in South Carolina since August of 2014. So this is a, a very prominent case for South Carolina. We have been covering it for, for years. We started with the first investigator who arrived to the scene at Mazelle and he was wearing a camera on his uniform. Sergeant Green, this is your body cam video, is that correct? That's correct. Your Honor, permission to publish this uh, exhibit to the jury. There are graphic images on this, so everybody needs to cover up their monitors, please. At this time, I'm going to fast forward it until he arrives, I believe, without objection from the defense. Without objection, Your Honor. It's right there to the left of the screen. What did you see right there? To the left was uh, Paul's body. He was laying face down on the ground. Large pool of blood around him. Well, let's keep going. What are we seeing to the right of this image? So on the right would be Maggie's body, also laying face down on the ground. Large pool of blood around her head. happening in, to you while this is being relayed to you? No, it's very sad. It's, it, it's, it's a void in my heart that I will never be able to, to fill. This crime was just so brutal and also so personal. And whether or not you saw the photos the way the jury had to, we know that Paul's brains were down by his feet. There is parts next to him there. And we know that Maggie was shot, you know, execution style, you know, in the back. We see an individual standing. Who is that? The individual standing in the background would be Mr. Murdoch. The person you previously identified in this courtroom? That's correct. Did you ever see him approach the bodies? I did not see him approach them, no. Did you observe any visible blood on him? There was no blood on him that I could see. I'm a parent to two children. And if my spouse and one of my children is found in a horrific state like that, I would have been covered in blood from head to toe, you know, taking them and, and holding them. That didn't happen here. Somebody going to check them? Yes, sir. They, they've already checked them. <laughs> they did check them? Yes, sir. It's official that they're dead? Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. <laughs> there was a lot of evidence suggesting that the family had a close relationship and Alex and Paul had a close relationship. And just the idea of a parent killing their child, it was just a very dark and unusual occurrence. To believe the prosecution's case, you really had to put your mind into this very dark headspace. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, crime scene processing. Can you play that for us, please? Everybody recognized that given the significance of this family that, um, that Colleton wanted to bring SLED in. SLED is the state law enforcement division. They are essentially the state police. They do forensic testing for many agencies throughout the state, but they also are called in to work complex cases. But before SLED arrives, for almost an hour and a half, the crime scene is in the hands of the Colleton County Sheriff's Office. We don't have to disturb anything. We've got SLED on the way. We just leveled up because the family is here. Yep. And that's it. All right. Part of the defense strategy was clearly to cast doubts about the quality of the investigative work when the local police arrived. Let's talk about that sheet that was on Paul's body. Tell us, would you use a sheet to cover a body? We'd probably use a tarp of some sort. Something that's not absorbent? Correct. Any trace evidence, such as hairs, fibers, or other materials that may be loose could be picked up, especially when it becomes moist. All right, it now becomes like a sponge and actually picks things up and takes it away. Um, you don't know what's not there. If I'm the defense, you have to turn people's attention everywhere from where it's supposed to be. We're in the construction business, they're in the demolition business. That's basically what we do for a living. We build cases, their job is to tear cases down so that we can't get over the hurdle of beyond a reasonable doubt. What are they, covering them up? Preserve what we can. We have two dead family members in a very grisly scene, and we have a living family member present and other family members arriving. And so in that situation, common decency sort of wins out, and they were going to uh, cover those bodies with a sheet. And nothing about that has indicated that any sort of evidence that would have been of significance was compromised. I mean, it's totally false. They did not process the scene that night. Uh, clearly under any standards that uh, are recognized by forensic experts. You can see that officer is two feet inside the feed room? Yes, sir. Did you notice any protective covering on their feet? No, sir. No booties? Correct. What, if anything, under the procedures you understand, is the purpose of those? So that they don't contaminate the scene, and also the scene doesn't contaminate them. I mean, the integrity of the crime scene, there was no integrity. The police had totally ignored evidence. Hey, watch the step. And footprints. We found out later on one of those bloody footprints was the police. What? If I was at the original crime scene at Moselle, I would have protested and got everyone out of that crime scene that didn't need to be there. But the officers that responded to Moselle they had the cards stacked against them before they got there. You're talking about a prominent family, if not the most prominent family in this area. You're talking about a large, large area of real estate. And they did a great job with the hand they were dealt. The defense doesn't just highlight one or two issues. They point to a litany of seemingly questionable police work. I see uh, quite a few tire tracks in here. In your notes, you indicate it was the fire chief, I believe, pointed out to you tire tracks. The fire chief said, you need to preserve those. There's tire tr fresh tire tracks back here. And then cars drove over them. They were obliterated in a matter of minutes. Were any of these you going in and out? Um, no, I came in here and I left one time and I came back. Only two were mine. Did you go out this way at all? No. There were multiple tire tracks coming and going. What did you do to preserve those? Nothing. Did you take pictures of the track? I did not take any pictures of the scene. It's not part of my job description. Whatever tire tracks on the left were obliterated by your man. Is that right? It's possible those tire tracks if they could be matched to another vehicle were lost and as a result you couldn't determine whether or not a third party been there i've never seen a perfect crime scene i've never gotten in a vehicle to leave a crime scene and said man i did everything perfect because there's too many things happening around you 
There's too many different spokes on that wheel. Y'all familiar with this family? Yes. Uh, I wasn't until he told me the names. Name. Uh, last name, and later. Murdoch. We believe Sled came in and they disregarded every other potential suspect beginning that night because at that point they were sure the husband did it. The defense's theory wanted to assert Alec was the only person that they looked at and they never looked anywhere else. That is entirely untrue. Sled came in and they immediately started verifying alibis for uh, all the people that were involved in the boat case. Sled really focused on trying to identify anyone and everyone who could have had contact with them or who could have been on that property uh, during the relevant time period and excluding them. Paul Murdoch was that guy in the boating accident from a while back, if you remember? Yeah. Anytime that we got a tip or a lead, no matter how ridiculous or tenuous it was, it was pursued and hundreds of man hours were spent pursuing leads that never amounted or materialized into anything important. The defense is always going to challenge the sufficiency of the evidence. They're going to challenge the manner in which the evidence was collected. But none of that precluded any uh, significant evidence from being gathered. I was the first out-of-state reporter to go down there a week after the murders and went to Moselle. And I thought, isn't this strange? There's no crime tape. There's no barrier. There are two entrances to Moselle, and they were wide open. It looked to me then suspicious. And we know now that the crime scene at the time was completely mishandled. They were letting Alec Murdoch's brothers come in there. All sorts of people were walking into that place, onto the crime scene, and they weren't prepared for the world scrutiny. And that's what they got. You decided to attend the trial every single day. Why? In full, for support of my father. How grueling was that for you? Oh, well, it's incredibly grueling. I mean, every anxious, negative emotion is going through my mind at this point. I'm trying to take it in. I'm trying not to break down, trying to, to hold composure. And it's, I mean, it's an absolutely excruciatingly difficult experience. Day. No man should have to see what I found, much less have to relive it a second time. I can't get the images out of my head. I'm sure the hardest part is yet to come. First thing that the Collin County Sheriff's Department did was get a search warrant for the whole property. I don't. The night don't of the murder. They never searched the Moselle house for murder weapons. They never searched outside the Moselle, you know, on the track of land for murder weapons. They knew he went to his mother's house the night of the murders. And the, why they did not go to Almeida, which is where his mother lived, and search for the weapons and search the house is beyond me. Because the murder weapons aren't found that night at the crime scene, SLED Special Agent Jeff Croft searches the Murdoch's main house at Moselle the next morning. I went to the residence to secure any firearms uh, or ammunition, uh, spent shell casings uh, of that nature that would be uh, potentially compared to or similar in nature to what was at the scene. How are you doing, sir? There was a lot of discussion about the guns being everywhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people across the country watch that, and they, they think that's unusual. Yeah, no. Well, I, I can understand how someone can perceive it as unusual. All right, let's go shoot this one. We obviously grew up with a love for the outdoors, love for hunting. And I think everybody's seen the video of the gun room with the big gun cabinet where everything is and they're loaded and ready to go. Normally, unloaded would always be the key. You know, our, our father from a very early age taught us gun safety and to not really just be leaving a bunch of loaded weapons around. But sure, absolutely, there are times when, you know, you, you forget about it and they stay loaded and you forget to unload them. 
From the house at Moselle, sled agents collect an AR-15 300 blackout rifle and several 12-gauge shotguns. These are all the same types of weapons used to kill Maggie and Paul. I'm going to have you take a look at that and see if you recognize that. You go ahead and pull it out, just make sure not to point it at the jury. What is that <laughs> item right there? This is the 300 uh, blackout rifle which I secured from the gun wall. Yeah. Let me see it. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move State's Exhibit 84 into evidence. Your Honor, I object on relevancy grounds. There's no evidence that this gun was the gun. I mean, it's just not relevant. It was found in the house. Is it hate? Jason Hoover. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I would uh, put some further argument in the record in that the guns had been tested ballistically. The test excluded the guns as murder weapons, and as a result, they're just not relevant. These guns were around the crime scene. Issues have been raised regarding multiple guns, and that's the basis for the court's order with regard to admitting that evidence. Not we believe the judge gun. erred, with all due respect. The truth of the matter is there was no smoke coming out of that gun. There was, it, well, maybe it was just, maybe this is too cute, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> He's put it out his guns that they say were not involved in the murder. Why'd he do that? Within the first two days, we had six firearms introduced that by the prosecution's own admission had not one thing to do with the murder. Thank you very much. I think it's difficult for a prosecution to win a case without a murder weapon. They never found the shotgun. They never found the AR but they were allowed to put into evidence other guns so they could flash guns around the courtroom. Would it have been nice to recover those murder weapons? Of course. But if you know anything about Hampton and Colleton County, there's a body of water every 15 feet. It would be like finding a needle in a stack of needles. While investigators never find the actual murder weapons, the prosecution has a theory as to which weapons killed Maggie and Paul. Did Alex have a gun that he favored, a shotgun? He did. What was the one that he favored? That was a Super Black Eagle original black shotgun. On top of that, Sled took all of the 12 gauges in the house. There was no Super Black Eagle one. According to the prosecution, not only is a 12 gauge Super Black Eagle missing from the family's cache, but also missing is Paul's AR-15 300 blackout rifle the same type of gun that killed Maggie. There was a lot of discussion, obviously, about the 300 blackout rifles. We both got one for Christmas in 2016, I believe. So Paul's got lost. They went to a party. It was left in a pickup truck. And then when they left the party, the gun was gone and you know was never seen again. And he got another one. Apparently. So I wasn't really aware of that either. But after everything that's been said and heard, then yeah, it certainly seems like there was another one purchased. The prosecution does not have Paul's replacement 300 blackout rifle. There's two right there. Yep. But they do have five weathered shell casings found next to the house that Paul and a friend fired from his replacement gun several months prior to the murders. Yeah, 300, yep. Yeah. It's not unusual to see some shell casings laid around. They accidentally got ejecting shells out of the guns and stuff already out there, just shooting Skeeter. Might be some still laying on the ground out there, but ain't nobody picked them up. The state's firearms examiner, Agent Paul Greer, compares these weathered shell casings linked to Paul's 300 blackout to the shell casings that are found at the kennels around Maggie's body. What were your findings concerning those items? I was able to identify that the cartridge cases uh, recovered items two through seven near uh, the body did have matching mechanism marks with several of the cartridge cases that were around the home and several of those in the shooting field. The prosecution argues that these matching mechanism marks indicate that Paul's replacement 300 blackout rifle is the weapon that killed Maggie. So that was very significant. It showed that a family weapon had been used to murder her. 
after listening to all of the testimony by the state from these experts, I believed that the weapons that were used to kill Maggie and Paul were these family-owned weapons from Moselle that are missing. But the defense rebuts the prosecution's theory about the murder weapons. On cross-examination, Jim Griffin questions the reliability of the science used to compare the shells. The National Academy of Scientists issued a report and was pretty critical of the objectivity of your work. I'm aware of, of some of the criticism, yes, sir. Um, however, the, subject, the, the process of making the identification is subjective in nature, but it's based on some objective data that we're looking at. And Jim Griffin doesn't drop the argument when he questions SLED Special Agent Owen, who spoke with Agent Greer about the shell casing findings. You were informed, though, that <coughs> forensically at the lab, they could not say with 100 percent confirmation that that they did actually match until the missing firearm is recovered. Is that right? Of which, which he couldn't say 100 percent certainty which firearm <coughs> that came out of until he had a firearm to compare it to. Thank you. The problem is there's millions of these blackout rifles. So it wasn't exactly an exact science. I would call it more soft science, what they were relying on. Paul's replacement blackout. Do you think that's the gun that killed your mother? I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's the ballistic reports, and they seem to think that. I don't have the ability to contradict that, so that's what the, the narrative is. I'm really not sure that Maggie and Paul were killed with family-owned weapons. I, I really don't know, and there's no way to know because we don't have the weapons. If we had them, then that doubt would be eliminated. State your name again for the record. Michelle Shelley Smith. When the state couldn't come up with a murder weapon, they tried to tie Alex to a controversial piece of evidence. What was your role as a caregiver specifically for the murder? Mrs. Libby, taking care of Mrs. Libby. Michelle Shelley Smith was able to take care of Alex's mother, Libby for many years. They trusted her. She was a very um, kind woman. Months after the murders, Shelley tells a police officer that a week after the double homicide, Alec came by his mother's home very early in the morning, carrying something out of the ordinary. What did he do after he knocked on the door? Did you let him in? Yes, he came inside. And uh, did he have anything or was he holding anything? A blue tart, blue something in his hand. It's like a tart that you put on the car, you keep your car covered up. Can you show me how he was holding it? Like uh, this. Is all right if I touch it? Yeah, this one. How, how was he doing it? Like this. Holding something like this? Yes. Based on Shelley's testimony, they finally search the property where Alex's parents lived, and it turns out there was a raincoat, this blue raincoat, that was found wadded up in a closet. Uh, State's Exhibit 226. This is the raincoat you collected from that closet in Almeida? Yes, ma'am. This is rather large for a raincoat. Yes, ma'am. When you found it, it was balled up like this? That is correct. So the prosecution argued and they believed that blue tarp was in fact the blue raincoat that Shelly saw that night. How does a tarp suddenly become a raincoat? The only reason why the raincoat became so important is because of what they found inside it. Was there a lot of gunshot primer residue inside, the, inside of the jacket? I would say there were a significant number of particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue on the inside of this jacket, yes. How many did you determine? I, I confirmed 38 particles characteristic. What we found inside the blue raincoat was GSR, or gunshot residue. And so how does gunshot residue get inside of a raincoat? Yes, some hunter can be wearing a raincoat and gunshot residue gets on the outside of the raincoat because you're wearing it, but how does GSR get on the inside? Sled's theory is that Alec wrapped the murder weapons up in this rain jacket 
got his brother murder weapons and then stored it in his parents' attic, which makes no fun no, no sense whatsoever. And um, I suspect that we have an expert test all the quotes hanging in that attic. 90% of them are going to have GSR on them because they, you know, those, those are the shootingest motherfuckers in the world. If you're shooting any semi automatic weapon, what ejects the shell is, is the gas which is embedded with the, with the, with the gunpowder. Yeah, you're going to get it on your. You're going to get it on the inside of your jacket easily. These are people who are living in rural South Carolina. They're living on farm and hunting properties. There's guns everywhere. I think gunshot residue might just be on every surface in South Carolina. You were shown a picture of a rain jacket? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, and had you ever seen that rain jacket at the house? Not at Moselle, no, sir. They were never able to tie the blue raincoat to Ellie. No family member said, oh yeah, that's Ellick's raincoat. In fact, no one knew who owned this raincoat. How long had that raincoat been there? We don't know. So should not have been allowed in. Pure speculation. That's not evidence. It's a really inexact science, and to be able to tie this to Alec was kind of a dicey move. Raincoat would look like... We spent days on a blue jacket, which could have been a blue tarp. But ultimately, there was no blue tarp that mattered. I think that was just an interesting piece of evidence that would have given someone the ability to think this is probably what he could have done. But the existence or non-existence of that raincoat doesn't prove his guilt in my mind. There's so much other evidence out there. I don't see how anyone could think that law enforcement looks very good with how they handled everything. Hope I'm not wrong. Your next witness. Go have a seat up here on the witness stand. In addition to poking holes in the job law enforcement did, the defense brought on several witnesses that tried to say that it was not physically possible for Alec Murdoch to have committed these crimes. Based on your analysis, tell us how you get to a height for the shooter. So I looked at this, and whoever the shooter was in whatever posture they were in, the shooter's hand is 16.2 to 27.6 inches above the ground. So that's basically two feet above the ground. So what I've been showing you is a person that's five foot two. The um, person's how tall? The shooter's five, how tall? Five foot two. Could be someone a little taller crouching down a little bit? Could be. The defense seemed to be floundering at times, and one of their crazier theories, in my opinion, was that because Alec is six foot four, presumably a tiny person hanging out in the dog kennels, killed his wife and son. That seemed very far-fetched to me. And this is all trigonometry? These are angles? It's just trigonometry. I think conclusively that whoever fired those shots was somebody shorter than Alex's six foot four frame. Dr. Kinsey, can a person be on their knee and get the same angle and be standing and get the same angle? Yes, sir. Can a six foot four person and a five foot four person still shoot the same angle, just at different distances? Absolutely. So, in your professional opinion, can you exclude a six foot four defendant like Alec Murdoch from shooting that shotgun at that angle? Absolutely not. The defense not only attempts to make it seem physically implausible for Alec to have committed the murders, they have another theory of what happened that night. The defense calls Tim Palmbach to the stand, please. In this case, there were many, many moments where the defense is trying to create fact issues that create reasonable doubt. Mr. Palmback, do you have an opinion um, whether there was one or two shooters who murdered Maggie and Paul on the night of June 7th? I did have an opinion on that. And what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is the totality of the evidence is more suggestive of a two-shooter scenario. The state's theory is that Alec Murdoch killed his wife and son alone. And the defense's theory was that there were two people who showed up there, probably in retaliation from the boat case. It couldn't have been Alec. It would have been two people not part of the family. 
like two marauding bandits as the state called them. Two five foot two to five foot four marauding bandits who knew where the family guns were kept at the kennels and knew when Paul and Maggie would be down there. There is just, in the, in the anybody who deals with firearms, a logical argument here. If one of the weapons is the Blackout 300, well, that comes with a, a, a high magazine capacity. There were two guns. Well, one was a high-powered assault weapon, and the other was a shotgun. And if it's one shooter, well, why are you carrying two guns? You, you can get 20 to 30 rounds in there. So, so why do you need a shotgun? The two-shooter theory is uh, inconceivable because two persons could have carried out both of those murders a lot more efficiently than what we saw, a lot more organized than what we saw. Why are there so many shell casings? Casings were everywhere because this was spontaneous. If you believe your dad's innocent, your mom and your brother's killer is out there somewhere. That's what I believe. Would he get someone else to do it? No, ma'am. I don't think that he could be affiliated with endangering my mother and brother. I mean, that's, I mean, we've been here for a while now and that's been my stance. So are you fearful for your life if you believe the killer is still out there? Absolutely. I think that I've set myself up to be safe. But yes, when I go to bed at night, I have a fear that there is somebody else still out there. We have what's called the CSI effect. People, um, because of watching those shows, are always coming with this idea that there's always some sort of magic piece of forensic evidence in every case. And the reality is that's not the truth. And so as prosecutors, we're constantly managing expectations with jurors. This is all amazing technology that most of us carry around in our pockets. This cell phone keeps track of who we're calling, who we're texting, whenever we access apps. And every time you do that, there's a record kept in this phone. And if you're using certain apps, you can even get GPS information where you were when you did that that's stored on these phones. You're going to hear evidence about that. What I wanted them to understand was that was the most powerful forensic evidence in this case. I'd go on record to say I learned more about a cell phone during the trial than I ever wanted to know. So Maggie's phone was found the next day on the side of the road off of the Mazelle property, um, and it was used by tracking her phone, and they finally found it. Alec had Maggie's passcode to her phone, so they were able to easily open it up and access the phone call records. Paul's phone was found on his body. Alec Murdoch says he touched the phone, and then he realized he shouldn't be touching the phone, so then he places the phone on Paul's backside. Alec Murdoch did not have the passcode to get into Paul's phone. There were multiple attempts uh, to try to uh, get into that particular phone. It can be very, very difficult, particularly if you have to do what's called brute forcing a password. Essentially, you start a computer program and it does 00001, 00002, and it just keeps going. And that can take, that can take forever. It eventually went to a Secret Service individual and tried a few things and put in some seed numbers. And one of the things that worked was a birthday, and the phone popped right open. From what I've heard, Paul's cell phone was like an extension of, of one of his arms. He had it on him all the time, like typical for you know a kid 22 years old. Using mobile phone data from Paul and Maggie's phones, the prosecution is able to glean information about their final moments. You're looking at the habits of the two murdered victims. You're looking at how they operated in their life with how quickly they read texts, how quickly they responded, when they stopped. SLED Special Agent Peter Rudolfsky is called by the state to put together a timeline of the day of the murders based on this information. 84901 is the last time before that, that Paul had ever unlocked his phone. That is correct. And at 849.31, what happens to Maggie's phone? Just seconds later. Maggie Murdaugh's phone locks forever. The prosecution believes Maggie and Paul's time of death is right after their two phones lock at 849 p.m. 
when you look at how we use our cell phones and when you also when you look at a particular individual you see how they use their cell phone that when you see a change a very significant and abrupt change in the way that those phones are used i think that's very much reasonable uh, assessment of a time of death what's the chance that two people that are on their cell phones at this time consistently on these days now both of them stopped at this time. But not all experts agree with the prosecution, including Farhad Manju, an opinion columnist for the New York Times who focuses on technology. I think that one of the most interesting uses of technology here was the prosecution's argument that the time of death was related to when Maggie and Paul stopped using their phones. But there was evidence that Paul's battery was down to 2%. I have stopped using my phone before because it's at 2% and I want to preserve the battery. It's plausible that he just decided the same thing. They could have not looked at their phones and then died minutes up to an hour later. You could be addicted to your phone, but if you put it down for a few minutes, that doesn't tell you anything about your physical state. Establishing a time of death was very important for the prosecution because there was a video on Paul's cell phone which was taken at 8.44 p.m. and then Maggie and Paul's phone stopped any sort of meaningful activity at 8.49, which is when they are contending the murders happened. How did you pull up? I went to the house and they weren't home. I knew they had been down here before I left to go to my mom. Okay. And so... Alec from day one had always said they had a family dinner and then he took a nap. <laughs> and that's when Maggie and Paul went down to the kennels. And then when he was going to visit his parents, he tried to call her a few times. And that's when he left and went to his mother's, stayed for about an hour, came back. And that's when he went down to the kennels and found the bodies. So they left and went down to the kennels. Well, Maggie went to go to the kennels. Okay. Paul and Paul left. And I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming Paul left okay. because of, you know, gotcha. what happened. I mean, I'm assuming Paul yeah, yeah. went to the kennels. Okay. Um, and what did you do once once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. He was adamant that he never went down to the kennels. Earlier in the day, when you were down at the that shed in the kennels with uh, Paul, and you didn't go back down there after dinner until your return trip from visiting your mother. Yes, sir. He never changed his story until that trial. They call you next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. We call Rogan Gibson. We met Rogan really young. We obviously played sports together and against each other. And we just grew really good friends. And then he actually ended up moving right down the road from us. So when we had our four wheelers and everything, we could just drive down and, and hang out. Rogan, he would be working out of town and he can't take the dog with him to take care of him. What's the dog's name? Cash. What uh, arrangements did you make for Cash when you were staying in Buford? I would leave him at the kennels at Moselle. During the course of that day, June 7th, 2021, did you have any communications with Paul? I did. Paul and Rogan are having a conversation about an injury that they believe occurred to the dog's tail. They're talking about it on the phone, and Rogan tells law enforcement that he thought he heard Alec's voice in the background. Alec denied that and said he must be mistaken because in Alec's story, he was never down at the kennels that night. It was a story he stuck to all the way up until the trial. You talked to Paul and, and what did y'all talk about? What was he gonna do? He was gonna try to FaceTime me. He said, you know how the service is out here. He said, if I can't get the FaceTime to go through, I'll send you a video. Did you ever get that video? I did not. The Snapchat video was never sent to Paul's friend, Rogan. It was forever only on Paul's phone. Paul's video is recorded at 8.44 p.m., about five minutes before the prosecution says Paul and Maggie are murdered. Get back, get back.
Quick, Cash. Come Quick. Based on the metadata we know, the video was made, 844, where Paul is talking about the dog's tail. And you can hear Maggie in the background talking about their dog. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. They've established that Paul's phone went dead at 849. So that's when they think he was killed. So presumably he was murdered just about five minutes after this little scene by the kennels. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Do you recognize Paul's voice? Yes, sir. Do you recognize Maggie's voice? Yes, sir. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba. Do you recognize Alex's voice? Yes, sir. 100%? Yes, sir. Can you point out Alec Murdoch, the person whose voice you recognize in this video in this courtroom, please? Sitting right in the grave? Yeah. Please let the record reflect he's identified the defendant. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Nothing further. That was a crucial piece of evidence because it proved something that we already believed to be true but couldn't prove, that Alec was there literally several moments before they were brutally murdered. So the feel in the courtroom was absolute utter shock when it came to the cell phone video being played for the first time. I was able to see the expressions on people's faces when it was played, and it was such an inaudible gasp and a look of, aha, oh my goodness. It was like bye-bye alibi, just a heartbeat. Come on, come on, come on. 